Good evening, everyone. I'm Susan Glimcher from the Advisory Council on Historic Preservation, and we're delighted to host the third webinar in this series, Preserve the Past, Build the Future. We're so glad you've joined us tonight and hope you will join us for the next and last webinar at the end of June. During these presentations, please put all your questions, discussion items, or thoughts in the Q&A. After the presenters are finished, we will go ahead and call on you by name so that you can ask your question of the speakers directly and interact with them directly. At that time, please be prepared to be unmuted. And if you do have video on your computer, we can also ask you to turn your video on so the speakers can see who they're speaking with. Now I am delighted to introduce Mr. Robert Stanton, former ACHP expert member and the former director of the National Park Service. Bob. Good evening, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, friends all. Thank you, uh, thank you very much, Susan, for that uh, gracious uh, introduction. It's, uh, it's a pleasure to, uh, to be with you uh, this evening to uh, discuss a topic that is of immense interest uh, uh, to me. Uh, preserve the past, build for the future. With an emphasis on supporting the preservation of African-American uh, historic places. It has been my privilege to have been associated with uh, the preservation of our rich and diverse cultural heritage for almost 60 years. Uh, I was first introduced to the National Park Service uh, while I was an undergraduate at Houston Tillerson University in Austin, Texas, working seasonally uh, in Grand Teton National Park in Wyoming, uh, but uh, becoming a permanent employee with the National Park Service in 66 and stepping down as the 15th director at the end of the Clinton administration in January 2001. It was a very fruitful journey. And then to be appointed by President Obama and served as six uh, years working with Susan and Lynn as a member of the Advisory Council on Historic Preservation was a remarkable way to top off my career, if you will. But let me just say very briefly before introducing our first speaker that I really was uh, bitten, if you will, or touched by the significance of historic preservation. When I served in my first superintendency in the National Capital Region, and I had the great pleasure of initiating through the use of uh, roughly $450,000 appropriation, the initial rehabilitation of the home of my old time hero, Mr. Frederick Douglass. His life and legacy are commemorated in the Frederick Douglass National Historic Site in Washington, DC. And that really, really introduced me to the importance of preserving our collective heritage and particularly from a heritage perspective, the African-American experience. Today, there are roughly 40 areas within the national park system that Congress has authorized or either the president through a president of proclamation specifically designate sites or special places to commemorate the struggles, the achievements and the contributions of African-Americans. And additional areas over the years will obviously be added. But within the uh, jurisdiction of municipal governments, state governments, other federal agencies, and certainly uh, in the private sector, there are historic sites that commemorate the African-American experience. And our next speaker is a leader in working with the communities, with state governments, uh, with national governments, with the National Park Service, and certainly with private property owners in preserving those special places that commemorate and keep us on track in honoring our ancestors at these historic sites. She is the program officer for the African American Cultural Heritage Action Fund of the National Trust for Historic Preservation. She and her colleagues at the National Trust are doing a magnificent job in touching the lives of so many involved in preserving our collective heritage and particularly engaging our young people with hands-on preservation. And at this time, we are honored to have with us Ms. Lawana Holland Moore, 
who again is a program officer for the African-American Cultural Heritage Action Fund of the National Trust for Historic Preservation. I don't know how you get all of that on a business card, but uh, that's who you are. <laughs> Nawana, Nawana, we're honored to have you with us. We're honored. Thank you so much. <laughs> well, um, thank you so much for that introduction, Bob. Um, I'm here to tell everyone today about the work that we do at the Action Fund. And I will go ahead and share my screen. All right, let's get this going. <laughs> okay, I love when technology works. <laughs> the Action Fund was created in 2017 in response to the events in Charlottesville. Um, the Action Fund is a multi-year, multi-million dollar initiative of the National Trust for Historic Preservation. This was the climate in which we were created. As you can see on the left, that's Mother Bethel in Charleston, South Carolina, which was the site of a massacre of its congregants by a white supremacist. On the right is the African Meeting House in Nantucket, which was vandalized and acted, which is still unsolved. And in the middle is the rally in Charlottesville. And this is what inspired uh, the National Trust to create this initiative because we are committed to crafting a narrative that expands our view of history by telling the full story of African-American historic sites. What we most want people to remember is that African-American history is American history. And we, can, we hope to continue to draw attention to the remarkable and still largely unrecognized collection of places and stories of Afri African-American activism and achievement. And through the elevation of their stories, we contribute to our nation's um, collective narrative. No, every, organiza every organization, um, if you have a strong board, it helps in so many ways in terms of acting as a support. And you can see here um, is our National Advisory Council, which is comprised of so many black scholars and luminaries, such as the head of the Ford Foundation, Darren, Darren Walker, and Dr. and preservationist Felicia Rashad, who are co-chairs. Also included among those luminaries are Bob Stannon, who gave me that wonderful introduction. Not only is our board supportive, but they are active. They are out there promoting this work, supporting our work, and we are so grateful to them for everything that they do for us. And now I'll go ahead and I'll tell you more about the Action Fund itself and the programs and initiatives and projects that we've supported. We have um, actually hit and surpassed our original goal of $25 million. And we'll now enter phase two, which is so incredibly exciting to us. And we are currently in the process of determining this year's awardees who will be announced in July, including year four of our national grant program. Since January, 2018, the National Trust has actually vetted nearly 2000 proposals requesting nearly $190 million. And we have awarded $4.3 million to 65 awardees nationwide so far. Last year, we awarded $1.6 million to 27 sites and organizations. And through this program, we see the breadth of African-American preservation needs. In this photo, this is a photo of Joan Maynard, who was so instrumental in the preservation of Weeksville Heritage Center in Brooklyn, New York, one of the largest antebellum community, African-American communities. And it is inspiring. And so when we are inspired by her in terms of moving forward, in terms of how we um, identify and elevate African-American sites and stories. 
as part of our funding, we also fund projects at the Nas and National Trust Historic Sites. Um, so far, we have funded 10 projects, including one that was um, at the Will Woodrow Wilson House, this fantastic jazz program, and that's what this photo was from. Um, we've also um, funded a project at Shadows on the Tesh in Louisiana, where playwright Aoife Baeza created an entirely new play around the life of Bunk Johnson. We aim to reinterpret and reimagine um, these spaces and to be able to give um, more of a fuller story of these spaces themselves. Our National Treasures Campaign, um, National Treasures Program, we have supported 11 campaigns, which includes um, sites such as Shaco Bottom in Richmond, which we'll talk about later the John and Alice Coltrane House in Dix Hills, New York, which is pictured here, A.G. Gaston Motel in Birmingham, the Nina Simone Childhood Home in Tryon, North Carolina. These places and spaces, they're so important to African-American history. Um, we fund these projects because they, their stories need to be told and we want to continue to preserve them so that generations of Americans can continue to visit them and see them for themselves and experience these tangible connections to the past. We also work hand in hand with our HOPE crew, which stands for Hands-On Preservation Experience. This is a program of ours um, that encourages um, interest, and participation in the preservation trades. And we involve youth volunteers, veterans, and also have community days um, in which the community themselves can also come out and participate in projects that help restore historic sites. And this, um, in this photo, you can see that they're working on the fence that surrounds the John and Alice Coltrane home. We are so excited about our HBCU initiative. And we just announced our first round of recipients this year in February. Um, the HBCU Cultural Stewardship Initiative helped to support and fund the, um, it helped to support and fund stewardship plans at eight HBCUs. We are giving two campus-wide preservation plans to Morgan State University and Jackson State University. We are giving also six preservation plans for individual structures at Philander's, uh, Philander's um, Smith, Tuskegee, Benedict, Stillman, Lane, and Spelman Colleges. And we're so excited about being able to help preserve and maintain and come up with plans to continue to preserve and maintain these very special places. Another part of what we do is that we help to have preservation leadership trainings in which we bring together organizations to help them in terms of board training, governance, helping to literally strengthen their organizations so that they can continue to do the best they can in terms of helping to preserve these sites and to be able to accomplish their goals. We actually are now in year three of our fellows program and we're so excited about them. Um, this is last year's cohort, which comprised, um, it's interdepartmental, so they get a chance to work with different departments within the National Trust, such as Brianna Rhodes was our editorial, fellow and Daisy Taylor is a Green Book scholar and she um, created a project about Green Book sites in Harlem. Jenna Dublin worked with us in terms of helping, and she was so instrumental actually in terms of developing our equity report which looked at gentrification and displacement in historic African-American communities across the country. Yoruba Rishan is, is a filmmaker and she will actually be working with us as part of this year's cohort, creating a documentary film. We are currently in the process of getting our new fellows on board and we're so excited because we want them to think of innovative and creative ways to think about preservation 
and tell the stories of African-American historic sites in new ways. And we are so incredibly excited about them. I also mentioned our fellows earlier and our equity report. And you'll see here that these are our 10 research fellows who were our boots on the ground out there talking to the community to find out more about how gentrification and displacement were directly affecting members of the community. They were so fantastic and instrumental in terms of finding out that information and helping to inform our Preserving African American Places Equity Report. One of my favorite parts of my job is this. Technical assistance is so important because we find that often you need almost a bridge between the public and preservationist, preservation practitioners, that we speak a language that isn't often understood. And nine times out of 10, if there's inquiry regarding African-American historic sites from the public, you'll get me. <laughs> and I love talking to the public about what they can do to help to protect and preserve their historic sites. I get questions such as, how do I go about getting my historic site designated? How do I get a marker or a plaque for my property? How do I talk to any someone, anyone about funding? What can I do? And I love being able to actually tell them what to do next. It's one of my favorite parts of my job. And, and this photo is actually Rockway Center, which was the headquarters of the Colored Women's Club in Oklahoma City. Because in addition to offering technical assistance to the public and other preservation practitioners, actually, we also, um, we also are involved in interventions. And if there is a site that needs support that we feel is, wait a minute, we should probably be involved somehow in trying to continue to preserve the site, then we will. And Brockway Center was one of our success stories in terms of those interventions, because not only were we were able to um, save it from demolition, but working with partners in Oklahoma City, we were able to come up with plans and for its reuse. And it was um, one of our 2020 awardees in terms of being able to create that plan for its future. And now I'll talk to you more about how the Action Fund and its awardees help to look at the almost intangible these places that once were, but are not there anymore. How do we preserve them? How do we make them sites of memory? How do we make them places again? And one of these places is Shaco Bottom in Richmond, Virginia. And it was along the, along the James River in Richmond, it was once lined with auction houses and slave jails. And from 1830 to 1865, Shaco Bottom was second only to New Orleans as a major slave trading center. And despite this legacy as a place of both pain and resistance, it became a parking lot paved over and largely forgotten except by those who saw it as this important sacred space. It was named to the National Trust 11 most endangered list in 2014 and became one of our national treasures um, subsequently after. And there were efforts to actually turn this site into a stadium complex. And luckily <laughs> this was stopped in 2015 by the National Trust and its partners. It's community driven proposal to create a memorial park um, you can see a rendering of or a plan of it here. Um, it, this gained traction in 2017. And it, it, was, it was actually among one of our first action fund recipients in 2018. When we think about Shaco Bottom, it is a place that you wouldn't think anything happened there if you didn't know. But by being able to go forward and think about what can we do to now memorialize this place, bring its story to light. We can now create a place 
that's not just a memorial, but a memory. Upon emancipation, newly freed African-Americans set out West to create somewhere new for themselves and their families to live. And these freedom colonies can be found all across the country. The University of Nebraska Center for Great Plains Studies set out to not only identify these African-American homesteader sites, um, they also including some that had been lost, but they wanted to help preserve their memory and to bring recognition to them. Um, we're talking about forgotten communities from DeWitty, Nebraska to Empire, Wyoming. Sully County, South Dakota, to the Nicodemus, Kansas National Historic Site. Their stories were retold once more and acknowledged through historic, mar historic markers and the creation of a digital archive that was created and donated to the Homestead National Monument of America. Um, one, uh, one of our, they are actually one of our Action Fund awardees and our funding was able to help provide for this identification and evaluation and create, creation of this database. Um, this was, I believe they were one of our first, in our first cohort in 2018. And um, by helping to do this and working with descendant communities and other partners across multiple states, this project helped to rediscover these sites and bring their stories to light once more. From 1865 to 1920, settlements called freedom colonies were founded by formerly enslaved persons throughout Texas. Led by Dr. Andrea Roberts of Texas A&M University, Dr. Roberts saw a need to recognize, document, and identify these places of self-determination and help to create this project. Dr. Roberts saw an opportunity to use ethnographic methods such as oral histories to examine not only the locations themselves, but how descendants of these settlements used grassroots preservation methods themselves to protect them, such as cemetery maintenance, because often, these cemeteries were the last remnants of these settlements. The project research team had, has been able to now map 357 of these sites and discovered over 557 place names, rediscovering and reaffirming these places of memory and heritage once more. And we are so proud to, for them to have been one of our awardees in 2019. So much of what we do in the Action Fund is about telling the full American story. As I said, to bring these stories of these African-Americans historic sites and places to light once more so that future generations can continue to be insp inspired by them, to be able to visit them, to be able to have this connection, this very tangible connection that they can walk in, that they can touch, that they can see, that they can be present in that past and looking forward towards the future. Thank you. And now I'd like to introduce Jim Turner, who is president of Turner Restoration. Good evening. And thank you. I am um, happy to be here this evening and talk to you all primarily about historic preservation uh, and the hands-on restoration that we do in that effort of preserving our communities our neighborhoods and our sacred buildings. In that, over the last, golly, I would say now close to 22 years, I've worked uh, in historic preservation um, by doing the work of wood and steel window restoration. And this discussion comes at a time when we have a dearth 
of tradespeople in that are not coming into the trades in the volume and numbers that they did in the past. I think that we have to address that. And I've tried to do my share in addressing it through the work and effort of historic preservation training. Uh, earlier, Lawanda mentioned the women's club uh, in out, uh, in, out of state. I was fortunate enough to do a wood window restoration workshop with the regard we are able to provide a vehicle to give individuals within Detroit an understanding of wood and window restoration and how to maintain and upgrade the energy efficiency of their wood windows. In the course of this uh, the being asked to be a part of this presentation, I, I asked myself and, you know, in the back of my head, asked myself, really, why me? Uh, and I've uh, asked that off and on in the course of the last 20 years of doing restoration and being involved with historic preservation. Part of it is passion. One part is the fact that I try to move forward and do the work as opposed to asking how I should. In providing more information to those that are interested, I try to offer ways of providing training and using the talent that I have to educate, to share with those that are interested. Historic preservation, I found in my efforts uh, over 20 years ago, uh, was something that allowed me to change the direction of my life and build more energy, more excitement, and enthusiasm with being involved uh, in the restoration of historic buildings across the country. Luana also spoke about uh, Shaco Bottom, and I did a project in Richmond, Virginia, when Shaco Bottom was, as she stated, generally a parking lot. And it was encouraging to know that the National Trust for Historic Preservation offered a plan to tell those stories of those people that walked those paths, moved in those, through those streets, and sometimes sold on the slave blocks that were there in Richmond, but to build a new and to share that experience uh, was something that I found encouraging overall. Yes, um, historic preservation is a value to us all in the way that it opens us up to the stories of our community, to sometimes the heartache and the pain of our past history, but also the joys of how we have risen. And as uh, Maya Angelou has stated, I rise. Yes, I do rise day to day to find myself renewed in the knowledge that historic preservation has um, provided a life's work for me and a mission to, to move forward. And at this point in my life, the ability to try to share that knowledge and provide it ongoing. Over the last 10 years or so, I've been working both in Detroit and in Louisville, Kentucky, in a training center there to provide historic preservation training and move that uh, so that we are offering a pathway for individuals in distressed communities to gain knowledge and understanding of historic preservation practices that they can build a career, a new career, or in the midst of a change of life through historic preservation. As we revitalize, as we revitalize our communities, we can revitalize our spirit, the soul and strength within us 
to start again and renew ourselves again within our communities. Through that effort, I've partnered with several nonprofits, the Kentucky Center for African American Heritage, lately, as well as Mount Zion a Baptist Church in Shelbyville, Kentucky. In that effort to move a training opportunity through the redevelopment and restoration of a clo formerly closed U.S. post office in Shelbyville. We are conducting the restoration of those wood windows and hopefully a second phase of the steel windows at the Shelbyville post office and working with that community, opening up further development on their main streets. I ask that you join us and ask the questions you need to ask and open yourselves up to the possibility of learning a trade that can help build and grow your future as we move forward in developing our communities. I will move this on now to probably Lynn or Susan as they come and open questions, uh, open up the question and answer session for you. Thank you much. Thank you all very much. Lynn, would you mind turning my video back on? I appreciate your turning it off. Okay, hold on. There we go. Thank you all very, very much for those two um, presentations. And personally, I want to thank you both for the incredible work you're doing for such an important cause. This is something that should have been started, oh, you know, 400 years ago. But here we are now, and it's remarkable. So thank you all. We have a couple of questions, which I would love to get started with. Um, so the first one I will read out loud. And then from then on, um, we'll go to the people who wrote them. Luana, tell us what challenges African-American historic sites face in the efforts to preserve them? Well, I think one of the biggest is them being recognized as being important sites to preserve in the first place. And so often because of that, a lot of these sites are not, they're not grand mansions. They're not these spectacular places. They're often, you know, vernacular structures, meaning that they might be simple. They can be plain. They can be a hole in the wall. <laughs> And, but they're important to the community. They're important to the history of the community. They could be very important to African-American history. And for that reason, um, a lot of times these places can be missed, omitted um, in terms of being identified as being somewhere that is important to save in the first place. And then also, you know, a lot of times things get to a crisis point. They reach a crisis point before, um, anyone feels they are taking action and often it's too late, things are lost. Um, another, another challenge to this as well is gentrification, that through gentrification, displacement of a community, you lose often what made that community, that community, um, that that history becomes lost as the persons who were once such an integral part at that community leave or are forced out due to reasons such as rising property taxes and other reasons. So, you know, there are a myriad of challenges in terms of the preservation of African-American historic sites. There sure are. Thank you, Luana. And now we have a question from the audience. I hope I'm gonna pronounce your name correctly. Is it Deja? Deja Fisher, would you like to join us on screen and unmute yourself and ask your question? Yes, ma'am. 
I'm not sure if you all can hear me. It was um, kind of We're having a lot of trouble understanding you. You're breaking up, but we do see your video picture. Unfortunately, you're frozen now. So let's go on and we'll come back. How's that? Um, okay, Jim, how do students find out about how they can learn about this, the um, trades training? and the skills that they would need. Are schools that offer courses in this advertising or is it word of mouth? There are programs through nearly every state, but one of the programs that the trust offers as Lawanda stated earlier, really is the Hope Crew. It gives a group of uh, young, young people between 18 and 25 an opportunity to work. Uh, on Hope Crew projects throughout the United States. I've had the good fortune of working in, uh, uh, golly, Birmingham, uh, Alabama, Tuskegee. I've been to Tuskegee on three occasions working with the students uh, at Tuskegee and doing window restoration. The, the exciting thing about that is understanding the history of Tuskegee and the fact that people actually came to Tuskegee and were offered jobs so that they could, one, learn and earn while going to school at Tuskegee and help in building the college there. Um, and you, you get the sense, uh, not the sense, you get the story and the reality of how you do pull yourself up by your own bootstraps. And by having a, a university offer a way for you to work through your tuition and building that, that university and that standard there. It was so gratifying to have an opportunity there. Working at the, um, with, uh, in, in Michigan and build a, build a block with the whole crew, one of the first opportunities I did on the, the east side of Detroit along Jefferson Avenue was, a, was offered, generally they're offered every summer uh, through through the uh, the National Trust, and there's a whole crew somewhere, and a number of them that are going through HBCUs. Great, thank you. Um, we have a question from um, Tom Kaufman, and I don't think he has video, but he does have have audio. So let's hear it, Tom. You're gonna have to unmute. Okay, how's that? Perfect. <laughs> um, my, my question was uh, the most often used air base and airstrip used for training by the Tuskegee Airmen is still in existence north of the city and is separate from the restored Moton Field. Though the most northern base site, uh, which is not Moton Field, but it's this, this other base uh, that they use the most, was bought several years ago by a private owner and is now a vacation hunter's lodge with a lake, though a substantial amount of the base itself seems extant, still existing. Would your program be able to help to reacquire this base even in a seed effort initiative to begin with? Uh, thank you. Okay. Is that, that, is that for me? <laughs> um, <laughs> um, well, I think for, for one thing, I would need more information before I would be able to say that. I think if anything, we, let's, let's talk after this. <laughs> <laughs> and I can find out more information if there, if there is something that we can help out with. I think it's been a <clears throat> real heartbreak for, for those of us here in, in the community and, and that, that are here at the college. And by the way, Mr. Jim, so good to see you again. Thank you. Um, but, uh, you know, um, it's just, um, you know, I just wondered if that would fit, you know, I, ideologically into what you were sharing earlier about, a, you know, as a historic site that could be 
uh, even in the early stages of being um, in a seed effort, trying to be reacquired, uh, I know it would be difficult. Uh, the person who owns it is uh, extremely, how can I say, has, has great resources. Mm. And uh, so that, that makes it all the more difficult. But nonetheless, uh, that was where most of their training was done, you know, f learning, flying from that base and so forth. So I appreciate you letting me ask that question. Yes, definitely. Um, let's we'll t let's talk after this. You can send me an email, and we'll set up a time to talk, and uh, we'll okay. find out find out more about what can be done. Okay, thank you so much. Okay, next I'm going to go ahead and read Deja's question out loud, um, just because of the issues of technology. And this question sounds to me like it could be addressed to both Luana and Jim, and that is. Good evening, everyone. What was the most touching or overwhelming historic site that you all helped to preserve, preserved, and why? Luana, you want to start? That, that's an easy one for me. <laughs> um, one of our 2020 awardees, um, Vernon Chapel AME Church in Tulsa, Oklahoma. It all started with one of those technical assistance phone calls for me. Um, I got a call from their pastor, Reverend Turner, who told me, you know, we have the last remaining structure from the Greenwood Massacre in 1921. And I sat there like, wait, wh what? <laughs> and, I, and he told me that there was nothing left of the prosperous, vibrant neighbor, African-American neighborhood of Greenwood in Tulsa, Oklahoma. Um, after two days of terror, when essentially a mob, a white mob rampaged through the community, looting and burning it to the ground and killing hundreds of its residents. So the only thing that was left on Greenwood Avenue was the church and its members took refuge in its basement. And after they held church services right away and its congregants rebuilt the sanctuary, rebuilt this church and inscribed their names upon the stained glass windows. So Reverend Turner was calling because those stained glass windows needed to be stabilized with the construction of a highway more or less right behind the church. Um, it had started weakening the windows and the wood around the windows and the windows themselves needed to be restored. And after he told me that story, I simply said, you have such an incredibly amazing place. I'm going to see what I can do to get you some money. And sure enough, it was such a compelling story that it, it made it through and became one of our 2020 awardees. And it received our largest award of $150,000 for the restoration of those stained glass windows. Not only did it receive $150,000, but they have been able to leverage it to $1 million more since. And I, I, I cannot tell you how much it means to me to know that, you know, I had a piece of piece of this, a part of this. And Reverend Turner says, you know, you were the first one to believe in us and believe in this. And knowing now that it's 100 years later, they're celebrating the 100th, not celebrating, actually commemorating the 100th anniversary of the Greenwood Massacre next Monday <laughs> on the on the 31st. So to know that um, you know, I could help in any way um, has been so incredibly moving for me. To, uh, to follow that is going to be a bit difficult. <laughs> Luanda has had an opportunity, I think, to, to look at some of African America's, African Americans' most precious sites uh, and to work to, for their restoration. Um, one of those for me was my, my trip to 28th Street Baptist Church in, in Birmingham, Alabama. And to experience just the 
the impact and the story that was being told up and down those streets. was in itself incredible. So it causes pause that where we are today and the suffering of the past and gratitude for the opportunity of being able to work on the structures that so many lived and worked in and worked around in the course of their day-to-day -day life. I guess every day, being able to work in, uh, in communities of distress and uh, has been a wonderful experience for me overall. I can tell that that's very moving. Thank you to both of you. Um, well, I've made connection with Deja again. So she would like to ask the second question and is going to do so um, with audio, but no video. So Deja, let's hear it. Good evening, everyone. Can you all hear me? Yes, ma'am. Thank you for answering the question. I really do appreciate it. Um, I'm a recent graduate of Elizabeth City State University. I graduated two weeks ago, actually, on Saturday. And I, too, was preserving. I'm sorry. Congratulations. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much. And I too was preserving, but we did um, the old Oak Grove Cemetery and it was the African-American cemetery. And it was truly, it was, it was moving and I had a lot of emotions surrounding me because I, I felt so bad, like this is the community and the part of Elizabeth City Eisen is predominantly African-American, but it's like the community wasn't taking care of this history. And I'm like, even if it is history, we can't let it be history. So I feel like it's our duty to go ahead and preserve and take care of what we have, um, what we have left because these people, they had lives and they have stories and we need to live through that. We need to continue to tell and preserve. And I think that's really important. So I do thank you for um, those that feedback. It's really moving. Um, and my second question, I am looking forward to working in the preservation field, specifically in African American history. And I wanted to know if you all were accepting new applicants or recent grads. I'm not sure who that question is really addressed to. Um, Deja, could, do you think that's a question, for example, for the National Trust for Historic Preservation? Um, for jobs at the company that La the organization that Luana works at, um, or the advisory council, can you give us a little more guidance on who, who should answer that? Um, Miss, I can say Miss Luana. I'm not sure where she's located. I don't remember if she's in the DC area. In DC. Okay, then yes, that would be for you, Miss Luana. <laughs> well, we are currently not, I would say we're not currently accepting applicants, but, oh, wow, hmm. because, wow, I'm just trying to think in terms of, <laughs> normally we have something called the Kalani Fellowship, but that would have been for if you were still in graduate school, that you would have been oh. able to work with us more directly. I don't think we currently have anything open. But that oh, doesn't okay. mean you, that does not mean you should not be looking and checking. Right. The National Trust is an exceptional organization that has done so much good. So follow their um, website and their social media to make sure you catch any job openings that come mm -hmm. up. And we look forward to seeing you in Washington, D.C. Thank you. 
Yes. <laughs> if I could Thank add. Thank you. Thank you. If I could add, Deja, what you should look look to is also your statewide, your state historic preservation office and officers. Uh, look for the cities within your range that you would like to work within, the communities there that may have a historic uh, historic district commission uh, and or that you could work through uh, in getting an understanding of some of the regula regulatory system that is out there. But there are offerings, other training, or other training could be gained through the National Park Service, through some of their apprenticeships, uh, if you are looking at hands-on kind of training in historic preservation. And you can also okay. look at other historical organizations as well, um, through, uh, depending upon where you are, and also your interest as well. What If you're someone who, who's, who turns more towards the trades, then you know there are opportunities there. If you're someone who tends more towards the cultural side of things, um, there are so one great thing I think about historic preservation is the fact that there are so many directions that you can go in in terms of what you do that you're not locked into doing one particular thing. Especially as a new grad, you're kind of almost still kind of sorting out where you'd like to go. And the great thing about preservation, I think, is that you can move within these different spheres within the field itself. So I think that I'll, I need to, let me move on to the next question, but um, Patricia and Shayla, I know you're on as well. If you could post in chat, perhaps the website for the National Park Service, the website for the National Trust for Historic Preservation, and the website for the National Conference of State Historic Preservation Officers. Those are all um, organizations that work in historic preservation. And please also, as everyone is saying, look into your local historic, organi historic preservation organizations because they're all over the place. They are. So, okay, so now I Thank would like you. to- you. Sure. Now I would like to turn to Kayla, who has been waiting patiently all this time. <laughs> Kayla, would you like to ask your question? Uh, yeah, so I'm uh, about to graduate this weekend from Tuskegee University and I'm going to the University of Pennsylvania in the fall for my master's in historic preservation. And I've just been like struggling to kind of like pick a focus. And I just kind of wanted to know like how you guys kind of wound up where you were specifically like in um, in terms of what you do. I didn't know at first. <laughs> I didn't know. Um, I came into historic preservation as a career change actually. I had been doing uh, PR and editorial work before that. And um, actually my undergrad, I have a um, double degree um, in both history and journalism. So I was coming into it from that background. And when I first started the program, you know, I loved architecture, I loved history. I thought I was going to be like, it was going to be about structures and buildings. Yes, all buildings, yay. And what I found is that over and over and over again throughout my um, program, my time there, I was writing papers about underrepresented communities, about how preservation affects underrepresented communities. And my thesis ended up being about literally that significance and ethnic minority heritage values. In other words, um, do what communities think are important? How does that fit in with what preservation considers important? And so, you know, I kind of ended up on that path and you just don't know until you're kind of almost in your, in your program, because as I said earlier, you might find that you are a hands-on person. You want to be out in the field doing things. That's the type of work that you want. Or you might find that you truly love doing things like reviews and policy. So keep your mind open as you go into your program. Keep your mind open about what you would like to do because once again, there are so many paths that you can take in preservation. You can write your own career in this. And that is a fact. Um, most of my time I was in sales and marketing as a starting and a career. And it wasn't until I really got involved in my community and became a volunteer 
at Preservation Wayne at the time in Detroit that moved me more and more towards preservation and understanding the African-American experience in Detroit and the African-American communities. And then beyond that, it opened me up to the communities that overlaid each other as we as a population grew in Detroit. So you have to be open so that you can experience and accept and receive all this out there for you. And preservation is one of those, historic preservation is one of those arenas that offers you that, to be hands-on or to be uh, regulatory or, or to be a consultant, if you will, uh, and giving people advice and understanding, open that understanding up for historic preservation and rebuilding their community. And also too, another thing, um, knowing that you're going into a graduate program in historic preservation, um, definitely consider our Kalodney Scholarship Program, um, which includes an internship at the National Trust. And you essentially get to work with a department in the National Trust, uh, pretty much of your choice. Yeah. And uh, <laughs> Thank you, I definitely will consider that. Thank you so much. Ayla, I think most of us who are over the age of 25 would agree that it was a winding journey in some cases for us to find where we wanted to go. I personally didn't discover what I loved until I was 40. So the advice you're getting about keeping your mind open and exploring all avenues is great advice. But don't feel the pressure that you have to make decisions now that you're going to be married to for the rest of your life because right now is the time for you to explore all these wonderful opportunities and stay in touch you are always welcome especially welcome because we love tuskegee to contact any of us with questions or asking um, advice or suggestions um, that's what we're all here for Thank you guys so much. I think I'm just kind of feeling pressure just because like other, some of my other like uh, members of my cohort already like declared and what they want to do. And I was just like intimidated. And so I was like, I don't know, but <laughs> thank you guys so much for all of your help and willing to keep in contact with me. So I definitely will be reaching out to you all. Absolutely. Don't yes. feel that pressure. I, the students I have met from HBCUs are literally the smartest students in universities and colleges ever. And you guys have a lot of pressure on yourselves. So just explore and enjoy all the different opportunities that you have. Okay, thank okay? you. And, and stay in touch. I mean, not, to mention, not to mention that we want more preservationists of color. We want more African-American preservationists. There's a stat that only 1% of us are African American of all, we're talking professional practitioners, period. So, you know, we want more of us in this field to be able to tell our stories and to be able to do this work. So, um, definitely, you know, congratulations. And, you know, I'm yeah. just adding in if you're out there interested in doing this. Thank you guys so much. So, Tom, I'm a little unclear. Did your question get answered in the chat, or would you like to ask a question again now and just wrap things up? You are muted if you're trying to talk. Okay. How's that? Perfect. Um, she did answer. Thank okay. you. Thank you so much. I I will say what it was about. It was about working in uh, historic black commercial business districts and Main Street initiatives and, uh, you know, did the program help? And uh, and she affirmed that it did. So that was the answer to my question. I did. If I could, I'd like to just just comment and congratulate Kayla, uh, who, who's here. And uh, and I know Kayla. And I wanted to say that life begins at 50. <laughs> so, <laughs> and uh, I'm living proof. So, and, and not to say, not to say that the other 49 uh, years, um, you know, uh, I used to have this idea that when I got to be older, that decrepit, you know, the 
being decrepit and this. But what I've found is life, life is the foundation I had in my younger years set the stage for what I'm doing now. And now I'm 61. So, I mean, I don't mind revealing my age, but uh, uh, <laughs> don't, don't look at, you know, getting older as, and, and, and also being confused. I think I was the most confused individual at age 19. And the hard thing was everybody saw it. <laughs> so it took, you know, it took a while for me to discover, you know, what I really was interested in. That's true for all of us. Thank you, Tom. Sure. All right, we're going to wrap things up now. I want to thank everyone so much for joining us. I would like to remind all the attendees that on June 30th, we'll be holding our last webinar, Preserving African-American Historic Places. This is really going to be an interesting session. We are going to be hearing from someone who is like a hero to me, just exactly like Luana and Jim. Her name is Joby Hill, and her company name is Saving Slave Houses. And her research examines the architecture of slavery. She goes in and she preserves slave houses. So please mark your calendar, June, 30, 7 p June 30th, 7 p.m. Eastern time. Thank you all so much for joining us and have a great rest of the week. Good night. Thank you. Good night. Thank you.